Um, hi everyone. Um, I just want to say thanks to Create Leicester for having me, um, especially during the first kind of virtual meetup. Um, yeah, I know, I know how uh, testing they can be, so no, you're doing a great job. Um, but yeah, I'm really pleased to be able to bring you this talk tonight. Uh, I've done this talk a couple of times before over the last year, but I think in this kind of recent situation that we're finding ourselves in, you know, a lot of us having to work from home or having to really adjust our kind of work-life balance. Um, I feel like the topics in it are, are really, like James said, they're really apt for now. Um, please throughout it, um, as is mentioned, please use the Q&A function. Um, at the bottom, if you have any questions throughout the talk or, or at the end, I'll do my best to answer those um, at the end. Um, and as James mentioned, my talk's been pre-recorded, so I already do a bit of an intro in that. So I will stop blubbering on now and I will let you hear it. Uh, so a bit of text switch over just now. Uh, da, da, da. So. Hi everyone, um, I'm Lex, uh, or Alex, Alexandra, Lofty, whatever you want to call me, go by many names on the internet, um, but um, I'm here to talk to you about knowing your worth, looking after yourself, um, especially within our industry. Um, these are lessons that I've learned um, working in the agency world. Um, and the title of this talk comes from a quote which I really love and that really resonates with me, um, which the full title is, don't set yourself on fire to keep others warm. Now, whoever coined that phrase, I'm stealing it because it is a wonderful metaphor to convey what I want to talk to you about. Um, so a little bit about me before I kind of crack on. Uh, in my personal life, a lot of you may recognize me as the person who posts lots of Pokemon GIFs on the internet. Yep, that's me. Um, I also really like to play Pokemon, um, whether that's the trading card game uh, on the Switch, Game Boy, Pokemon Go, like you name it, I love it. Um, as well as that, I love going to gigs and festivals, and that makes me really, really sad right now because I can't go to any. Uh, I was supposed to go to a festival next month, supposed to be at a gig last week. Yeah, it's really sad. Um, but in this situation right now, I am currently living my best life on Animal Crossing. So if anyone wants to come and visit my island, just hit me up on Twitter and, and we can meet up. Uh, lastly, uh, I help organize Design Exchange, uh, which is another creative meetup. It's usually held in Nottingham. Um, we're virtual too at the minute, um, obviously in the situation we're in, um, which, you know, isn't great, but also opens it up to uh, more people being able to attend our event uh, that might not have been able to before. So if you would like some more virtual goodness, uh, check us out. Uh, details are at dxnevent.com or on Twitter, we're at dxnevent. Um, okay, so I guess what is probably the most relevant to this talk is my passion uh, and career choice. Uh, I am a designer. Uh, I'm a senior designer. Uh, I've got nine years in the field. Uh, specialising in digital design, um, but I am also multidisciplined uh, with experience in brand and print. Uh, most recently I've been trying my hand at motion graphics as well, um, and I can maybe even say I've got a little bit of coding experience, um, but I'll expand upon that later. Um, I'm not really going to go into the technical stuff in this talk. Uh, I want to keep this talk really open to anyone who works or wants to work in the digital industry, um, which is hopefully the majority here. Um, so yeah, I'll kick off with what made me want to give this talk. Um, so I started nine years ago, straight out of uni and into a junior design role at a digital agency. Um, so I want to give you an idea of how I progressed throughout those nine years. And I'll do so with a graph. So on the bottom axis, axis uh, my progression as a designer, uh, career progression from uh, 2011 to now. Um, and on the left is what I call my level of OMG, what the, you know, 
uh, of like stress, anxiety, general fragility and vulnerability on that scale. Um, so here's my progression for around the first seven years. Like there's ups and downs and every day presents its own challenges. Everyone's like a work in progress, but essentially, you know, it, it kind of goes down once you get more experience. And then a couple of years back, this happened. And this is when the line just about went off the chart and I hit this horrible breaking point. And the trigger here wasn't even a big deal. Uh, it was a creative difference between myself, my creative director and a client. Um, it was nothing that wasn't like easy to resolve. Like it, it was nothing that I didn't end up working through. Um, but why such a spike? So it turns out that I'd let a lot of factors like boil up inside me. Um, things that I hadn't really addressed, you know, issues that I hadn't really worked through. And uh, when you pump up a balloon with little bits of air, eventually it's going to burst. Um, so yeah, I'd like to cover the kind of lessons that I've learned. Um, and I'm continuing to learn over the past couple of years um, and how I've managed to take that line kind of back down to here again. So, so around that time, as I was figuring out why I'd had a total meltdown, my brain was mostly looking like this. Um, one mistake had triggered this complete sense of fraud in my head. And after seven years of experience in the field, I had lost like all confidence in my professional ability. It was, yeah, it wasn't good. Um, so on my travels through the internet, I stumbled upon this article on Creative Review, um, which is from 2016. Um, unfortunately, it's paywalled now, but it talks about imposter syndrome. This was the first time that I'd heard that term. Um, and I'd like to go over a quick explanation of what that is for those of you who might not know. So imposter syndrome was um, originally called imposter phenomenon, uh, coined by two American psychologists, uh, Pauline Clance and Suzanne Imes. Um, to sum up, uh, essentially imposter syndrome is this feeling that despite overwhelming evidence to prove otherwise, you are a fraud. You feel like you are a fraud and that you fool others into believing that you're good at what you're doing. And I imagine this probably sounds kind of familiar um, to some of you as well. Because when I started looking into it, I realized that it wasn't just me who felt like this. The article talked about imposter syndrome from a creative perspective. And I finally got this grasp on all these feelings that I'd been struggling with. Um, I understood that it was actually pretty common for those in the creative industry to, to identify with imposter syndrome. And when I looked further and read further into it, I could see that imposter syndrome wasn't even just uh, reserved for the kind of like everyday person like me. Um, so this is uh, Jodie Foster uh, and she won uh, an Oscar for best actress um, for her role in The Accused. Um, and in an interview, she said this, she said, excuse me, we meant to give that to someone else that was going to Meryl Streep. She won an Oscar, like one of the most, you know, the biggest sort of prizes in film. And she claimed that, you know, she claimed that everyone would find out that, you know, she was a fraud and it, so it, it's wild that, you know, people like that can, can feel like that, even when they're being given such an award. Um, and then this one is even wilder. So this is a quote from Meryl Streep herself. Um, why would anyone want to see me again in a movie? I don't know how to act anyway, so why am I doing this? Um, you know, Jodie had her wobbles and said, oh, they should be giving it to Meryl. And even Meryl feels like this, you know? Um, she, she's had her own wobbles with imposter syndrome. And just for reference, um, Meryl Streep holds the record for the most Oscar nominations of all time in the big four acting categories. So if she can feel like that, you know, it can happen to anyone, even the masters of their craft and field. 
so I felt like that trigger of my breaking point of the big spike in that graph could be explained by imposter syndrome. Like, I was a senior designer, for goodness sake. Like I'd worked hard to get to that point and had like, all those years of experience and I knew I could do it and I did do it in the end, but it was my brain convincing me otherwise. It was my brain telling me that, you know, I was a fraud. Um, so at that point I kind of took a step back and I realized that it wasn't really the first time I'd felt this way. Sure, it was like the first time that it had that horrible consequence of like a breaking point, but I'd seen the kind of signs and symptoms of imposter syndrome in myself before this point. And what I found really useful in managing it and working through it was to first and foremost kind of recognize the trigger of what caused these feelings. And for me, it was getting negative feedback. And not just negative feedback, but bad feedback. The kind of feedback that you can't really understand and you can't address what the issue was. And feedback that makes your brain kind of go, I have no solution to solve this. Um, <laughs> like when people say to you, uh, oh, I don't like it, but I'll, I'll know when I see it or, or like it needs to pop more. Yeah, you know, these stupid design cliches, but they're cliches, but they do happen in real life. And it's, and it's these kind of bits of feedback that are really, really hard to work through. Um, so when I received those, that's kind of when I felt like my most worthless and fraudulent as a designer. Like if I couldn't magic the solution, like who was I to claim that I was a, that I was a good designer. So um, so yeah, recognizing the trigger was really important. And for others, it, it, it might be something else. Um, I know a lot of people fall backwards when it comes to negative feedback though, and, and it can be a very common trigger of these feelings. Um, I did a lightning talk last year um, on some good tips when it comes to receiving negative feedback um, that I'd just like to summarize here. I found these really useful to follow after that horrible spike as well. Um, so the first one is don't take feedback personally. You kind of have to separate the person from what they do sometimes, especially yourself. So I started to kind of stop looking at feedback like a tax on my work and looked at it more objectively. Like it really, it, that really helped me on an emotional level. Question about feedback. So if you get bad feedback, like the examples I gave before, um, start asking more questions, like delve deeper into what is really being asked of you, if you can. Um, I think that's really important to be able to know, to ask more questions so that, you know, you might be one question away from it being a lot easier for you. Um, and the last is um, empathize with the client. So just to try and understand where the client's coming from. Uh, they might not have a great deal of technical knowledge um, or they might be a messenger for some other stakeholders. Um, just try and put yourself in their shoes and, and that might be able to help you work through that as well. Uh, so there's just like some quick kind of tips. Um, another thing that's hugely important in tackling your own wobbles is learning how to take a compliment. Um, something I think we could all do a better job of like, I get it, we're mostly British people and uh, it's in our nature um, to not be able to take compliments, like we find that really hard. Um, but for the sake of our own brains, I think we need to learn how to do it. So as an example, say you put a thing out there for the world to see, maybe not even the world, maybe just a few people, a few people on the internet. Um, you might get 10, 20 great compliments on that thing, like some really, really positive stuff. And then you get one bad bit of feedback and it is so easy to laser focus onto that one bit of bad feedback. Um, it's really easy for people to be negative, but it takes a lot more for people to be nice and complimentary, especially on the internet, especially behind anonymity. So, those positive compliments are worth way more than the negative ones, and so are you. I ask you all that the next time this happens and you get stuck on that one bad comment, consciously pick out one of the good ones and try and laser focus on that instead. Um, we need to kind of 
start recognizing these compliments and uh, work on dismissing that kind of pure negativity. Um, especially when it's not constructive as well. Um, like you're never going to please or appeal to everyone. And that's, that's just the nature of humans. Uh, what you can do is shift your focus. Shift your focus onto what makes you happy. Um, and there's also something that I would like you to try and avoid doing. Um, it's when we get a compliment uh, from someone, we can be very quick to associate it to something or someone else um, and not kind of acknowledge your own work. So say for example, someone compliments you on a bit of work that you did as part of a team. And then you say this. You go, ah, oh, I didn't really contribute much to that. It was all them, really. And while this seems like you're being humble, it really diminishes your own contribution. Like, your contribution is valid to that. So there's a much kinder way of addressing this kind of compliment, both to yourself, but also to the person who gave you the compliment. Because when someone gives you a compliment and you shake it off, it's awkward for the person that gave it to you. Like, bear that in mind, as, as humble as you may want to be. Um, so instead, you could say, thanks, I worked really hard on that with the rest of my team. That gives thanks to the person that gave you the compliment, and it also acknowledges your input into that piece of work to yourself. Like, your input was super valuable. Like, we could all really learn how to apologize less. It's a really hard habit to break. Um, but if you can recognize that it's something that you do quite a lot, then I urge you to kind of start taking some steps to changing that behavior. You know, the way that you speak to yourself and about yourself is just as important as the way you speak to others. Yeah, thumbs up. Um, I saw this really great graphic on Twitter by Dan and Donovan addresses some simple ways of kind of changing your language um, that you use in replies to emails. Uh, it showed a lot more of a confident approach in talking about yourself uh, and I've been trying to use this style of reply a lot more often. Uh, I find it particularly relevant right now. Uh, we're in a time where we can't interact with people, we can't convey that kind of tone of message um, when it's in its written form. So. I think being careful about how we write down things is really, really important right now. Um, and I'd like to kind of bring that up actually. Right now, tone is really important in communication. It is half of the battle of saying something. Um, and right now I'm really struggling with text-based comms as being like a main point of contact. Um, so say you're communicating with your team on Slack or Teams or whatever tool you use. Um, being able to convey that tone of voice is difficult. So I think that emojis are really, really important right now. And never in my life did I think uh, I'd be saying that emojis are a vital piece of communication, but here we are. Um, like a smiley emoji can be the difference between someone thinking you're blunt with them or not. Like a winky face can get across the fact that you're being a bit sarcastic. But people, People attach a feeling and a tone of voice to your message that might not be how you intended to put it across. So to help kind of read, like help that person read the message in the tone and the manner that you wanted is a lot easier if you use an emoji with that. Like I grew up in a time of like AOL and MSN, SMS, all acronyms. Um, Emoji was a huge part of that, or emoticons, as they were called back then. That was a huge part of communicating back then. It's, so it's not, it's not a new technology. Like Emojis are a communication tool that transcends language. Like They are a language themselves, and it's a really universal way of communicating, no matter who you're speaking to. So if I can get my dad to start using emojis, I can get you to start using them too. So I'll move on. Um, I'd like to quickly talk about failure. Um, sometimes we do fail, it happens, uh, and what I've learned over the past few years is how to fail correctly. And I know that sounds odd, but hear me out. 
Um, failure is an essential part of learning. Without allowing ourselves to fail, like we don't allow ourselves to make mistakes and then learn from them. So I talked about um, negative feedback. Uh, and for me, I saw, you know, uh, negative feedback as a mark of failure. Now, I look at feedback as an opportunity. It's an opportunity to learn, it's an opportunity to grow. And you might have failed, but that's okay because you've learned from it. We have to accept failure as a step to move forward for the positive. You failed, but that's okay. Um, so I'll, I'll move away from the feedback uh, thing as an example. And I'd like to frame this um, like lesson on failing in terms of learning a new skill or developing your current skills. So um, last year, I really wanted to learn how to use After Effects uh, to do some motion graphics. Um, I was really excited um, about doing it. And then um, I kind of fell down at the first hurdle. And that was like setting up the workspace. Um, my brain was telling me to give up. You can't do this, you're a designer. You don't know anything about video editing. Um, but instead of throwing in the towel, I persevered and I got there in the end. After four weeks of learning, I was doing client work in After Effects. You know this will play, yes. Uh, and how many times did I fail just making this small, really short graphic? Hundreds of times. I, every day I came up against something I couldn't do or just something I got completely wrong. And each time my brain said, like, stop, you can't do this. But I kept reminding myself that giving up is the easy option. That when you realize that you don't have to be perfect, you can finally make steps to be good. So I'm reminded of, of two great quotes um, that I love by Paula Scher. Um, I imagine a lot of you know who she is. And if you don't, she's kind of this god in the design world. Um, and she says it better than I do. Um, her first quote is, it took me a few seconds to draw it, but it took me 34 years to learn how to draw it in a few seconds. She's basically saying it takes a long time to learn something, plain and simple. And the second is you have to make a hell. Uh, it's through mistakes that you actually can grow. You have to get bad in order to get good. So you have to make a lot of mistakes in order to get as good as the first quote. Essentially, it all boils down to growth takes time, it takes a lot of mistakes, it takes failures, and you have to be the worst at something before you can be the best at something. That's polish. Um, and unfortunately, there aren't any training montages in life. Uh, this is uh, something I thought of adding into you after I watched Mulan. So Mulan is a film that has arguably not arguably it does. It has one of the greatest uh, training montages of all time. And if you've never seen it, um, essentially, Mulan impersonates a male soldier in order to stop her elderly father from being forced to fight in the army. She starts off pretty badly and then she eventually trains hard enough in order to get this arrow down from this massive pole and it's great. It's all set to this wonderful soundtrack. Um, anyway, I thought about this, and despite the montage only being the length of a song, in reality it would take Mulan hell of a lot of time to get that strong. Ages, ages. So I looked at how long that section of the movie was. It's three minutes and 22 seconds. The whole movie is an hour and 28 minutes. And I did the maths, and the, so the montage, correct me if I'm wrong, but the montage is only about 3.6% of the film. So what I'm trying to get at here is that in reality, it would take her so long to get to that point. But there's a montage, there's a shortcut. And in life, there are no shortcuts. And we can't montage our way through our own learning process. Um, we have to fail like plenty of times before we can get that Mulan moment on top of the pole throwing that arrow down at Shang, like, it, it just doesn't work like the movies. So, when I speak about failure, 
there is one thing that I would advocate for, and that is to celebrate the little wins. Uh, it doesn't matter how small, you know, it's, some things are such a long learning process that you need to celebrate the little wins, and, and this is a great example of it. This little horse celebrates when he conquers this tiny little step. Like, he builds himself up to it so much, it's such a big deal for him. And then, here it goes, here it goes, here it goes. And when he does it, he's loving it. He's loving life. So please celebrate the little wins when you, especially when you're going through that process of learning something new. Be more like this horse, honestly. So after talking about imposter syndrome and failure, I'd like to touch on expectations and address this question of, am I doing enough? I believe that sometimes our industry can really perpetuate this idea that we should always be doing something. We should always be busy. Um, we should be making a podcast. We should be reading 52 books a year. We should have a side hustle. God, I hate that word. I hate, hate the term side hustle. Like expectations feel just like another burden on your shoulders just because of the industry we work in and the ideals it pushes. And right now, during this pandemic, I'm hearing this kind of stuff even more. Like, this guy, people in positions of power and privilege especially, love to tell you that you should come out of quarantine with a new skill, a new source of income, a side hustle. Um, it's a pandemic. If I can make it out of bed and brush my teeth and struggle through a day of work, then that's enough. Um, have you ever heard this phrase, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life? Well, I think that's a really dangerous way to frame it. Just because you love your job doesn't mean that it isn't work. Um, and this way of thinking just perpetuates that idea even further that we should be filling our spare time with more work and more productivity. As a designer, we're constantly posed to this question. Should designers code? Designers who can code are more valuable. Should designers code maybe? Should designers write yes? Should designers know how to sell? Absolutely. Like, Jesus, I can't code. Like, I'll be honest, for years I've, I've always considered it, considered learning to code, um, but it was only because of that expectation to be doing more, that expectation that's put on you. Um, and what I did last year was I actually decided to give it a go. Um, the goal in my head was to kind of just dip my toes in the water of coding and see whether it was something I actually wanted to do and something I wanted to kind of integrate into my career. So I joined this wonderful group, um, called Project Function. Great bunch of humans. Uh, they provide free education and web development to underprivileged, underrepresented groups within the tech industry. Um, and I had an absolute blast. Uh, I learned a hell of a lot. I learned HTML, CSS, even a bit of JavaScript. Um, but after I graduated from the course, I made my mind up. Um, should designers code? I don't know. I have no idea. Should this designer code? No, no. And what's really important here, and the point that I'm trying to get across uh, in terms of the kind of expectation thing, is that I decided that it wasn't for me. It was my choice. Um, we shouldn't let those expectations push us to do something that we really don't want to do. And if you're a designer that wants to code, or you're a developer that wants to design or whatever, make it your decision. Don't let anyone else tell you to do it. Um, this is a great um, reference book um, for this, if you get a chance to read it. It's called The Life Changer Magic of Not Given a F. Um, there's a TED Talk which, um, which summarizes it as well, but um, essentially Sarah and I, uh, who wrote this, basically talks about how we use our time and how we need to kind of stop spending time that we don't have on things that we don't even want to do. Um, like imagine your time was money, why would you spend that on things that you don't want to spend it on? Um, yeah, we, we need to give our time more consciously because our time is valuable. Uh, I used to be really rubbish at spending my time wisely. I used to always say yes to people. And even if I didn't really want to do it, I said that. And, and now I look at things a lot more objectively and decide whether I want to do it or not and whether it's worth my time. Like saying no to things is a really courageous act of self-love. Like don't let anyone else decide how you spend your time. 
Um, and I'll touch on something else that adds this idea of expectation. Anybody seen a job advert like this? So this is the unicorn, ninja guru, wizard, whatever. Uh, this creature doesn't exist. Um, and if by some miracle you can find someone who does tick all those boxes, you gotta pay them well, which usually is the is the missing ingredient from these um, from these job adverts. Um, I once interviewed for a job where they were looking for this all round designer. Uh, they wanted like brand print, digital, the whole lot, everything. I I could do it, and. I didn't get the job in the end because they said, oh, you don't have any coding experience. I wasn't even on the job advert, but it was like, Jesus, what else do you want for this measly salary? So I felt awful at the time and, and uh, I realized I dodged a bullet in the end. Um, but I weep for the person who did get that job because the salary was too low. Um, and in the end, I know that they'd have been undervalued for the huge amount of skills that they could offer. Um, in my experience, like the best teams are made of people who possess the T-shaped skills. So you're kind of really great at one thing, which is that blue bar, and then you know you're you're kind of good at a range of other things, which is that um, that kind of green bar at the top. Um, I believe that employers need to kind of start looking for more T-shaped teams and stop looking for these unicorns to fill the jobs because these unicorns have way too much pressure put on them and not enough time given to complete the string of things that they'll be asked to do because of the breadth of their skills. Um, if, like, if you don't allow your employees the time and resources to do their job, you end up pushing them too hard and you end up with crunch. A crunch is a term used to describe overworking, putting in long hours, usually to meet a deadline, um, you might crunch if you're trying to get a load of work done before you go on holiday, for example. You know, you're putting in this kind of unpaid overtime. Um, and crunch culture is slightly different. So crunch culture is where a business uses this way of working as a long-term way of working, and it's considered normal. Um, I um I've been in a job previously where, you know, it, it was almost expected to do all this unpaid overtime, um, and it just became the normal thing. And if you didn't do it, you know, if you didn't do your normal job hours, you were kind of looked down upon. Um, so crunch culture really became a thing there. Um, this is a tweet from last year um, at Apple's Worldwide Developer Conference. Tim Cook rounded off his speech and he thanked the team for giving up their nights on weekends with their families in order to get the work done. Now it's not really surprising to hear that come from one of the biggest companies in the world, but it's still shocking that crunch culture is a huge problem in the tech industry. It's probably most prevalent in uh, games development. So Fortnite, anything by Telltale Games, Red Dead Redemption 2, all games we love, right? Well, I'm sorry to say that they are all built on crunch from underpaid and undervalued staff. Expecting people to give up lots of their valuable time without pay in order to complete your product means that you're either not managing your schedules right and your deadlines, or you're not, you don't have enough staff to cover that job, or you're deliberately taking advantage of your staff and exploiting them. Um, ultimately, crunch can end up causing burnout. And as someone who's paid to be creative on cue, I can't tell you how dangerous burnout is to my job. Um, if I burn out, I can't do my job. Um, and this industry is so fiercely competitive, it's just not an option for me. So I believe those of us who are experiencing this kind of toxic work culture all have a duty to call it out. Make your voice heard if this is happening to you. Uh, it's encouraging to see a lot of American tech companies unionizing more recently about this kind of thing. But um, employers, you've got a responsibility to your staff. You know, you've got to identify this in your company. If overworking your staff has moved from a temporary, temporary, a temporary <laughs> tied over solution, if it's moved from being, you know, short term to a full time way of working, then there's something wrong, and it's got it's got to change. Uh, and lastly, uh, I'd like to talk about maintaining a good work life balance. So remember that spike a couple of years ago? 
At that point, this was me. This was me trying to find my work-life balance. Um, as someone who, somebody who was exposed to the crunch culture, imposter syndrome, that pressure of always feeling busy, my life just revolved around work. And as someone who has a passion for what they do, and as someone who feels really lucky to have this kind of job, I kind of thought that was just normal. So when I, la la when I left my job at that point, post spike, I took a step back uh, and I truly evaluated what was important to me and what, what kind of work-life balance I wanted to maintain. It was a bit of a clean slate opportunity, I guess. So a previous talk that I've been to, um, someone was talking about negotiation. Uh, it was mostly centered around negotiating for money um, and finding that confidence in yourself to ask for that, uh, about knowing your worth, not being afraid to ask for it. Uh, I felt quite capable of that already. Um, it wasn't something I was hugely afraid of. Um, but the talk also touched on negotiating for time, and that was something I wasn't confident um, about asking for, and something that I never really considered. In my head, I'd kind of reserved like flexi time as something reserved for people with families. But as someone who doesn't really know if they want to have kids, why was I valuing my time at any less than theirs? So that was it. That was my rock in the ground, and it was something I had to have. Flexible hours. Um, I made it this one point that if I was going to find a job, I, I needed that to be needed that to be a thing. And you know, we're lucky um, where a lot of companies now in our industry are, are starting to open to their eyes this way of working. And especially now in this time of uh, coronavirus, some companies are being forced to recognise this way of working. Recognising people's different way of working is really important. You know, some people may not be morning people, whereas others might work best at 6 a.m. Giving people the tools to do their best work, whether it's flexible hours, better salary, or remote working, whatever it is, you're ultimately going to get the best from that person. So why not give them that flexibility? Um, but like as, my, as my last kind of point here, I want you all to kind of figure out what's important to you in order to maintain that work-life balance and, and make that your kind of immovable rock in the ground like I did. Uh, seek out that thing or negotiate for it at your current job. I did and my work-life balance is so much better. So, so much better. Uh, lastly, I'd, I'd like to address the current situation in relation to this. Um, I see and hear a lot online about how this lockdown is going to really open up employers' eyes about the possibilities of remote working. And in some ways, I do agree. There are a lot of companies out there that said they couldn't do remote working. And guess what? They're doing it now. So it wasn't so difficult. But in other ways, I don't want this period of working to be an example of what fully remote working is like, because it's not. We're in a pandemic. Um, I don't want companies to use this period of time as this benchmark um, of what it can be because lockdown remote working is not equal to remote working. Many people are struggling with their mental health right now. Um, we're in the middle of a pandemic, so I find my mind wandering to the worst of places in the middle of the day and it's hard to bounce back. Many people have children at home uh, and they have to juggle that responsibility of working from home and looking after their children. Many people have just become carers to the ones that they love during this. Um, and some people just hate having their home turned into a workplace. And we can't expect 100% productivity from these people right now. I'm sorry, but we just can't. Um, in that sense, we shouldn't judge how effectively remote working is right now because it's not remote working in normality. It's just food for thought. Um, it's important that we look after ourselves first and foremost, like nothing's more important than that, look outside. It's exactly what we're doing for the entire country. We're looking after everybody's physical health um, by staying inside, but we also have to look after our mental health uh, and our mind while we're staying inside too. Um, so I'm just going to try and wrap this up. It's not a plea 
for you to quit your job or negotiate um, and be a total diva at work, especially not right now. Like if you're still working at the minute, I, I consider you very, very lucky. Um, so uh, yeah, um, these are just some nuggets of information I've strung together into this talk. Uh, based on my own experiences um, that I believe could be valuable. So I hope there's there's one little thing that's come out of this that's maybe kind of a little, little spark under your butt um, to make a little bit of change, just a small bit of change um, at the minute. Um, it's really hard out there, so please, please, please be kind to yourself and be kind to others as well. Um, these are just the takeaways. Um, I'm going to send these slides um, over to the team at Create and um, I'll put them on my Twitter as well so you can kind of use them as a reference if you'd like to. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much um, for listening. Because um, this is a webinar format, I've put Tom up there giving me a little round of applause because hopefully <laughs> that's how it would be. Um, but thank you so much for listening. Uh, yeah, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Oh, thank you so much, Lex. That was, that was um, yeah, that's so good. Um, I think felt felt really um, felt really like the right time for that. Uh, um, you know, definitely feeling the difficulties of um, uh, working from home and having a pandemic going on at the same time. Yeah, um, <laughs> um, and I know with it, sort of imposter syndrome and, and stuff like that, it's something that I've definitely struggled with at times. And just to say thank you for being so open about that because um, you know sometimes it doesn't get talked about enough. Um, I feel. Um, should we go to the Q and A's? I know we've got quite a few in there. Yeah, we've got a few. Uh, oh, I've lost them. Oh, there. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm happy to to go ahead and take them. Um, there's a question from Kultar um, that says, "Are there any techniques you use to help improve bad feedback into more open-ended and positive feedback?" Um, that's a really good question and uh, it's definitely a struggle. Um, like I work in agencies, um, like I've worked in agencies for a long time and sometimes I'm not the one that is like the first point of contact with the person who's giving the feedback. So sometimes it can be quite difficult to kind of almost present your work and then also ask for that that way of giving feedback that is constructive um, but usually I find that if you work with a client on several different things eventually you kind of get into this flow of how to give feedback I think using um, using software if that's the kind of thing that you do that is meant for that so I do a lot of digital design so we try and use Envision quite a lot and that has like a comment system built into it um, and that's relatively useful but there's definitely um, there's definitely not a way of always getting it I think I think if you get that bad feedback like I said like it, instead of preempting it and trying to catch out before it's given I think it's a case of kind of asking questions afterwards and um, delving a bit deeper into what they actually mean to say so I hope that I hope that's useful and answers your question. Um, there was another one from Tanjit who said, oh, hello. Um, <laughs> she said, uh, uh, you mentioned being creative on the spot. Any tips or advice on what to do when feeling spent and idea out? Um, yeah, that is, that is a good question and something that I definitely struggle with. Um, I think when I feel like I can't be, for just from a personal point of view, when I feel like I can't be creative on the spot, it's usually because I've kind of got in my head about something or I've wound myself up to the point where I've kind of fizzled out and my brain can't get past this block. Like I had it today at work. Uh, like I got given something to do and I just couldn't figure it out. And then like my brain just got jammed. Like that's how it felt. Um, and I know this sounds really cliche, but like just taking some time out, like um, I just took some time out, especially working from home, it's quite good because you can kind of just walk away from your desk and I try and do something that like 
takes my mind off of it. So just going for a walk or listening to some music or at the minute playing Animal Crossing. Um, just things that I just enjoy in little short bursts to try and disconnect from that feeling that I had before I went to do that thing. And I kind of find that that helps sometimes, but there are other days where um, it kind of takes a day where you get out on the right side of bed <laughs> for it to, for it to uh, click, really. Um, yeah, it's difficult. Sometimes I wonder why I chose this profession. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, uh, let me just see. Um, an anonymous uh, question, which are, what are your other stakes in the ground other than flexi time and how can employers go further? That's a good question. Um, for me, obviously, like I said, it was, it was very much flexi time. For others, it might be, um, like a company car like it's a really I guess it's kind of like a personal preference so it's difficult for me to kind of say what those other things might be um but um like some people want to work three days a week and unless they go out and kind of say it or ask for it like they might not get it like you might be such the right person for a job that is advertised as say like five days a week full time but you might only say to yourself like I want to do four days a week like I've got other responsibilities on this other day and I can probably do just as much um yeah that's a that's a difficult one for me to answer really because I think it really lands upon what you personally want from a job and what an employer can can give you um I think I'm kind of in a fortunate position where I've been able to find that but it took a long time to get there like my first few jobs were definitely definitely not like that so so yeah I think uh, yeah it depends on the person really um oh oh there's quite a few more um there was one that you yeah, asked really coming in <laughs> was it was it you James that asked this one um that said do you think the current landscape or beyond will force newer designers to learn to code to be able to survive in this industry? I, I, I hope not. Um, like, I, I think trying to learn a new skill, especially right now, like I said, is, is really difficult. Like, especially if you're working full time already and you might have a myriad of other responsibilities like childcare and, you know, you might, like it, it's a pandemic, like you might have even lost someone or, or now you're caring for someone. Um, so I think it's really, really difficult if, if that is the case, like I have no idea what's going to happen. Um, it's quite scary to think that that might happen, but, um, yeah, it's, it's a tough one because you, if you're learning a new skill like coding as well, that's quite a good thing to have like a mentor for and have some like face to face time with with people. Um, and the fact that we can't do that as well is quite difficult. Like I find that quite difficult working from home at something I am good at, let alone like learning a new skill. So, so yeah, hopefully not. But um, yeah, that is a good point that, you know, businesses might be able to stretch to the point where they kind of need some unicorns. But yeah, we'll see. Let's see. Um, I'm trying to think. Oh, there is a there is a comment from Ian which I quite like that said people are talking about going back to the office, but why do I need to go back to the office when I can work as well, if not better, at home? And he makes a really good point. Like that's really fantastic if that works for him, and especially if he's moved to remote from an employer who um, maybe didn't offer that before. Like that's great if working from home works for you um but then there are other people who really prefer an office environment like i really prefer an office environment i really miss working in an office but the kind of point there and what is important is that hopefully after this um employers that can do so will hopefully be able to give their employees the option so you know they can say well, you can work from home if you'd prefer, or you can work from home X days a week. And yeah, I think hopefully 
you know, we don't all have to go back to the office if we don't want to. Um, but yeah, uh, right, let's see. We have one from Ewan Lockwood. Okay, these are new ones, so I haven't prepared. Uh, when you mentioned to make it your decision, can you give any examples of how to do that in the context of expectations from the team, company, culture you're operating within? Uh, I don't, I'd love to be able to say yes. Um, it's tough. I think there's some cultures that definitely won't gel with, with that way of thinking. Um, that was kind of caveated at the end by me saying, maybe don't make huge amounts of demands, but um, yeah, like there's, there's situations I've been in where I was like, I've just got to leave. Um, and right now, like I definitely wouldn't recommend that for people. Like uh, <laughs> maybe now is not the time. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it can sometimes come down to like the culture. Um, I think make, getting your point across without sounding bullish and kind of brash about it is quite important. But yeah, that, that's a tough one. I'm not quite sure how to, how to fully answer that. Um, well, we got time for another, maybe one or two more, Lex. Okay. Uh, do you have any advice on communicating this flexible working approach to clients, managing expectations while maintaining a positive relationship when they have a very different uh, culture? No, uh, yeah, I think um, with clients, uh, I, like I said, I'm not quite as client facing, but I work in a company where we we try and choose our clients based on how they fit us as well as how we fit them. Um, so, and I think a lot of that comes from the fact that, you know, we, we do work from home quite a lot and we do have flexi time. So sometimes people aren't available in the traditional office hours. Like we have like a core set of hours. Um, so I think that can depend on like how you, recruit your clients um and yeah in terms of communicating that um it's difficult like again I, i'm not as client facing um i'm not as client facing but um yeah hopefully that kind of that's it oh, that's my boyfriend <laughs> just doesn't like that um and last one oh my goodness there's loads now <laughs> Um, I'm not sure which one to choose now. We can, um, we can always get people to ask you on Twitter or anything like that. I'll follow up later if that, that works for people. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, Toby's asked a good one. I, I, can, I can answer this one. Um, Toby said, one of the things I found with imposter syndrome is it's greater when you're working solo. How would you approach this? And does working in groups of people in the same role help you? Definitely. Um, I've been thrust into working in a team and sitting with my team to um to working from home now and finding like, adjusting to that has taken it's been six weeks now and i've still not adjusted to it at all um i think the team are still trying to adjust to it as well so you know we've tried to have a lot more kind of zoom calls and stuff which doesn't replace the face-to-face -face, but it it definitely helps like we've we've put in scheduled time that can't be moved like in our calendar so we have like a catch-up first thing on a monday morning we have um we have an hour on a wednesday afternoon and that is reserved for uh reviewing work and design critique stuff so if you've been working on something you can bring it to that call and you can bounce ideas off off of the rest of us and that doesn't mean to say that there aren't times where we do that in between it's just that is fixed and it's not moving and even if you don't have any work that time it's time for us to catch up so i think definitely speaking up about if you feel that way as well like if you feel like um you're struggling with um with that kind of loneliness feeling um and that imposter syndrome feeling without being near your team definitely speak up and kind of kind of suggest a bit more face face time as well um and yeah, yeah, hopefully 
Hopefully that's answered your question there, Toby. But yeah, if anyone's got any questions, I'm at Loftio on Twitter. So yeah.